Welcome to The Divine Line coming to you live from Salt Lake City, Utah. I uh, <clears throat> was thinking about the very first time I pulled into this, uh, this area along the Wasatch Front many, many moons ago uh, in a 1964 Dodge Dart. Those Angry. two body panels were the same color. And um, it was like going on a missions trip. And in a sense, it was. Uh, very much Utah is a very much a missions area. Interesting missions in a different way now than then. Um, but um, a lot of things are the same. A lot of things have changed. There used to be a taco time near near here. I am very, very disappointed to report that it is no longer there. Um, I have to go down to the one at, um, on state. And was it 600 East? I think it's where it is. Uh, if I want to get my my taco time while I'm up here, which I will do, uh, probably tomorrow um, at some point, I would guess. A lot of things are the same. Today. A lot of things very, have changed. I used to was uh, teaching church history in in Germany. Love spending time with uh, our fellowship there in uh, in Germany. Um, State um, was we've been doing church history for I don't know a year and a half, two years now. Not obviously all the time, but uh, we're, we haven't gotten to the Council of Nicaea yet. So uh, we're going to be doing this for years and years and years. Um, I don't know if I'll even live long enough to, to get it all done. But anyway, um, you will notice that uh, we are live. Um, I don't have the shade down, so you can see a, a unit behind me. You'll see some driving by. You may have, we just had a helicopter go over. He was so low that he set off car alarms. He's going along. I am sometimes wonder if they do that just for the fun of it. Um, but it's a beautiful day. It's going to be like 74 degrees. Uh, in uh, Salt Lake City today, but by next Tuesday, uh, snow and uh, going to be totally different. So uh, thankfully, I won't be driving in that, but I could have some weather getting up to uh, to Idaho. So prayers appreciated uh, as we get up to Idaho next week uh, for, well, not this next week, but um, weekend, week after that for all the events and things we're going to be doing uh, up in uh, Moscow with the Canon Press and the debate on the 22nd with um, uh, Doug Wilson and recording other stuff. So busy, busy time. Uh, tonight I will be speaking at the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Magna and again Sunday morning twice and I believe Monday evening, I think. I should have had the schedule in front of me. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and then I will also be uh, preaching at uh, Apologia Church, Apologia Utah on Sunday afternoon and Wednesday evening. I'll be down in uh, Payson on Thursday. So we'll be doing a lot here in the um, in the Salt Lake City area. And uh, if you're in the area, certainly you'd be welcome. We were at uh, Southern Utah University on uh, Wednesday evening. That turned out really, really well. Very, very enjoyable uh, time there speaking on the Trinity. And uh, <clears throat> uh, had this is one of the reasons we do the traveling this way. I mean, we started doing this because of COVID, and everybody's like, "Well, that's all over with." I, if if you believe that, I think you're naive. Um, we have a pause right now. Uh, Germany. I was informed by my German friends yesterday voted down uh, a mandate for vaccines of people, even people over sixty. So it's gonna be so the the mandate is done in Germany. That doesn't mean people haven't already lost their jobs and everything else, but um, it's done for the moment. Even though the um, numbers worldwide, uh, won't go into this right now, but from what I'm reading, um, COVID is still a serious problem in the advanced nations that used mRNA vaccines. In the nations that used old style vaccines or really didn't have any vaccination at all, it's not an issue. But it is an issue for those who use the mRNA vaccines. And that should tell you something. Uh, in, a, um, in a sane world, there would be investigations going on and there would be heads rolling, but there will not be. It's not going to happen. Not, not now. Anyway, um, so. I think everybody's taking a pause right now because of the upcoming elections in the United States. They, they know that if the U.S. takes a lurch to the left, uh, to the right, 
uh, well, anything, it would be a lurch to the right, um, given the trajectory that we're on at the moment, uh, that that could cause problems elsewhere in the world. So I, I think everyone's just putting the brakes on, try to get us through this time period. I think they're really, really worried about a seriously patriotic, AKA nationalistic president. Don't wanna have nationalistic presidents, gotta have globalists now. Um, I think they're worried about someone like DeSantis being elected and because that would be a minimum uh, four years of a mess for them. And not that they don't have ways of rigging and stealing elections, but I think they still have to be close enough to, to pull it off the way they did it last time, which is in key areas. So I think they're concerned about that. So we'll see, we will see. Um, but that's why we travel this way uh, is because that's how it started. But now I really, really enjoy doing it this way. And one of the main reasons is I get to um, be with people and um, <laughs> uh, get to be with people and get to talk with people. And um, after the talk uh, in, um, in Cedar City, um, I met a woman and her son, her son was nine, and she told me that eight years ago, she and her family were in the LDS church. And then they stumbled across videos and debates and talks by myself and some guy I've never heard of by the name of Jeff Durbin. And uh, the Lord used that, um, that ministry uh, to lead them out of Mormonism. And thankfully, not just out of Mormonism, but into the truth. That's, that's the real beautiful thing is when the gospel is the power that does that. There are a lot of people leaving Mormonism today, um, but the vast majority of them are not finding truth in the process. They're just part of the millions of religiously abused out there. And uh, so that kind of thing, I was walking on air when I left uh, from uh, speaking there in, um, in Cedar City. And I had sort of forgotten that that was the first night of the LDS Easter pageant in Mesa, Arizona. That hasn't been running for a few years. And so much of our experience with Alpha and Omega of witnessing the Mormons was out in at the Easter pageant in Mesa. And then of course up here in Salt Lake City. And so I started seeing on my phone that uh, there was some chatter about it, some discussion about it. Apologia had uh, about 40 people out there uh, the first night uh, passing out tracks and witnessing to people, uh, which is a uh, uh, year ago, June, I think it was, some missionaries tried to put something on on the front lawn of the LDS chapel right across from the temple in Mesa. And um, Apologia heard wind of it, and we ended up having more people there than the Mormons had. <laughs> so, so that's just sort of how that works. And we had done, Jeff had done two sermons in a row on witnessing Mormons. So uh, we were sort of, sort of ready to go. And um, anyway, uh, I saw a picture and I've put some of these things on Twitter. I, I know a lot of you don't do Twitter and that's we ended up having more people you, there than the Mormons had. But um, uh, I shared a picture that night of my daughter Clementine, my granddaughter Clementine, um, witnessing to an LDS a police officer right out there, out, out on Main Street there in, um, in Mesa. And I, I was, you know, I, I have pictures of my daughter, her mom out there. Um, Summer will still talk about um, her conversations that she would have out at the LDS Easter pageant. And so I know that those witnessing opportunities were very formative in her life um, to be out there and, and to be engaged in that kind of work. And so it was pretty cool to see Clementine out there. But then it struck me that you know, I posted it yesterday and again this morning together, put the two pictures together. I have a picture of me organizing our volunteers 
in those first years that we went out to Mesa. And the, the first year I even went out there and saw it was 83. And uh, that was when Wally Chope was out there. And then we started organizing, printing tracks, stuff like that. So I'd say this picture was from 85 or 86. I think it was 85. And, and I'm, I've got hair, but no beard. I had had a beard before that, but I'd shave it off. And my ubiquitous glasses. And I'm obviously very young. And it struck me that I was only 13 to 14 years older when that picture was taken than my granddaughter is now out there witnessing the Mormons in Mesa, third generation. And that just really struck me. I, because I can guarantee you, as I stood out there, the thought never crossed my mind. The thought didn't cross my mind of, I didn't have children yet. Um, and so the thought didn't really cross my mind of my kids being out there someday. And certainly not my grandchildren being out there someday. Um, as I've gotten older, I've realized that that probably should be part of our thinking. But I wasn't raised that way. And so it really, really wasn't. Um, but uh, continue to pray for them because the Easter pageant goes not through this weekend, but the weekend after. And I remember in the olden days, uh, you get to the end of pageant, you, you'd be hoarse. Your your throat would hurt. You but that but that was back in the days when you actually got to talk to people, when the, when the Mormons would actually stop and talk with you. Um, they it's tough to do now. You almost have to trip them and then apologize for tripping them and then and by the way, sorry about that, but not sorry to tell you. <laughs> That kind of thing be about the only way you can uh, get into conversations these days. And that's so, so pray for the outreach as it goes on uh, there in um, in Mesa, Arizona, and uh, for the various things I'm going to be doing up here as well, and then heading up to uh, to Idaho. So my, 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 uh, Judge Katanji Jackson Brown has um, – now been placed upon the United States Supreme Court. And the responses have once again demonstrated the fact that I, I think it is beyond question right now that we live in two nations at the same time. We live in a nation where there are still many people who hold to values and views that come from our past, from our constitution, from faith, various John kinds question of faith. right now that we live in and two those nations who have rejected time. all of those things, consider all those things to we be terrible, live, horrible, hateful, um, and who are looking forward to the utter banishment of such backwards thinking uh, from, from this nation. And a very wise man once said, um, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And I truly believe we are looking at a house very much divided against itself in our nation. But there are also many of those, um, quote unquote, within the church that are celebrating this um, action of placing this woman on the Supreme Court. And the whole reason is because of her skin color. Let's just be honest. That's what it is. There have been women on the Supreme Court before. Um, every one of them, I think, could tell you what a woman was. Uh, this one can't tell you or won't tell you what a woman is. But it's all about Church. skin color. It's all about race. That are celebrating. It is racism. It is black racism. Uh, it is black supremacy racism. But it's racism nonetheless. Because if, if you celebrate someone doing something simply because their skin color, you are celebrating a form of racism. And the issues related to uh, her judicial philosophy, her support of abortion, the reason she refused to answer a question about what is a woman because she is beholden to the radical forces 
and they are radical forces. They are they're they are only destructive forces. They cannot, you cannot build a society that does not know what a man or a woman is. It's just not possible. And so um we the 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 very fact that she was nominated on racist grounds, racist and semi-sexist grounds, uh, the, very, the very fact that the president of the United States had said, I will only nominate a black woman is an affront to the Constitution of the United States, is an affront to every thinking individual. Every adult in the United States should have rejected such absurdities. But a large portion did not reject those absurdities. And so you get what you get, you know, said that's what he's going to do. That's what he did. And the issue of character should be central in this process. And character must be determined today by whether you are an individual who wishes to see the annihilation of the human race as understood as creatures of God with transcendent meaning, or whether you're a person who will recognize your own creatureliness and will embrace those values that will then allow you to respect others. There is no basis within a secular worldview for respect of others. You can talk about it till the, till the cows come home. But the very fact that we see that people are willing to say, you must absolutely respect Bruce Jenner. You have to respect Bruce Jenner when he pretends to be Caitlyn Jenner. Will at the same time utterly refuse to respect someone who has consistently throughout their life said, these, this is what marks a man, and this is what marks a woman, and these are attributes that have been held by every generation before me, and I will continue to hold those perspectives. You can disrespect that person. You can cancel them. You can, you can call them a hater. You can call them a throwback. You, you can do whatever you want. So there's no consistency, and there can be no consistency in a secular worldview because there are no transcendent values that remain true, well, used to say from generation These to generation. are now it's from week to week. That's day to day. You you can there, there's that 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 uh, uh, thing on uh, the on Twitter where they catch people and they'll put one tweet up saying one thing and then another tweet up comes from sometimes a week later absolutely contradicting what was said in the previous one, demonstrating that there's no consistency. Well, I believe recognizing you should be consistent is a part of the image of God. But the left seeks to suppress that desire for consistency. And remember the, uh, the quotation from Dalrymple, that I've given you many, many times before about how the communists specifically would seek to force people to lie because people who are forced to lie are people that are easy to control. They've been neutered. They've been emasculated. And so uh, inconsistency, lies, hypocrisy, uh, these are the very tools of the left. They want you to be angry at the fact that you're being treated in an unfair fashion because then they've got you. Uh, they have no interest in being truthful and that's because they don't believe they'll ever be judged. There is no day of judgment. Once you remove the day of judgment from any society's consciousness, it's all over. And so a seat on the Supreme Court will now be held for what, 30 years, 40 years? Uh, by someone who is fundamentally uh, opposed 
to the claims of Christ. And yet what's amazing are the number of people. I was just looking at a uh, video. Um, where did I put it? Of quote unquote, re, yeah, interfaith service for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson on 3-30-22. And there are all these ultra leftist individuals of various shades of color and religion. And they're all talking about, you know, the one was praying and saying that she had walked through the valley of the shadow of death and was talking about how horribly she was treated in the uh, hearings. And I'm just like, she was treated with kit gloves. Have you already forgotten what they did to Kavanaugh? Have you already forgotten that circus? She was thrown softballs. She went through nothing. How anybody can even pretend to think you have to have the IQ and the memory of a wet shoelace to think that what she faced was anything in comparison to any conservative judge over the past 20 years. Ever since a guy named Joe Biden went after a black nominee for the Supreme Court. Remember that one? Yeah. But again, remembering history, being consistent, not something that the left is really concerned about. But at the same time that this is happening, knowing that Tanji Brown Jackson uh, will do everything in her power. She, she will not be a constitutionalist. She, she will not interpret the constitution. Her worldview is clearly one of changing the constitution. Um, in regards to the protection of human life, she gets this position at the same time, the California, Colorado, and Maryland are all passing into law the most draconian, Mengelian, infanticide laws that have ever appeared in the United States. And they are, they're infanticide laws. They will allow for the destruction of newborn children, not just children in the womb, but children who are born alive will be destroyed. And at the same time this is happening, and, and it's very clear that this has happened as a knee-jerk reaction to Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and, and places like this where there are laws either now on the books or soon to be on the books that restrict the central celebratory sacrament of the culture of death, abortion. Obviously, the evil one loves to take the lives of little ones. Moloch did that thousands of years ago. And the spirit of Moloch and the spirit that animated Moloch uh, worship still exists today and is seen in the legislators, in the governors like Polis in Colorado, who are so corrupt, so evil, so Mengelian in their worldview that they would spit in God's face. Because that's what you have to do. Think about, think about what it would be like to be a governor and the, the evil people and legislators send to you a bill that you know will result in the destruction of innocent lives by the thousands or more. And you have so little concern, so little thought about the fact that you will stand before God to be judged, that you would put your name on that. You have to have been given over. Your, your conscience has to be seared to do that kind of thing. 
And I, I hope you all recognize when I say Mengele, and I, I know most of you know what that means. I'm speaking of Joseph Mengele, the Nazi death camp doctor who never received in this life justice. Trust me, he is receiving and will receive justice. But he escaped man's justice. And you just simply look at someone like that as just the perfect example of the depth of human depravity. Well, there is um, there is far more today than there was then. People, we have people today who are smiling into our cameras, in our media, who rival any of the depths of evil that Mengele ever thought of, and they're getting away with it. They're getting away with it. They they do not believe there will ever be a judgment. And if I was a secularist, man, talk about hopelessness. Talk about hopelessness. It's, it's astonishing. Anyway, so we have all these people who are quote unquote religious people who are celebrating the elevation of an individual to the Supreme Court of the United States of America solely based upon skin color and completely without reference to the fundamental understanding of the most basics of a Christian worldview and of simply a, a worldview of sanity. I don't even know what to say other than God deliver us from such people. I was sent a clip from the, um, let's see, where to go? Uh, where, where did I put that? All right, well, too many, there it is, there it is, two. I only got one screen set up right now, so it, it gets a little confusolated. Um, I've never listened to an entire one, but there's something called the Holy Post podcast, which includes the Veggie Tales creator and some other woke folks. And these folks obviously present themselves as Christians, as um, uh, individuals who believe in the authority of the teachings of Christ. But they start off their program with a discussion of the Disney controversy. Now, I don't know if you've been keeping up, but um, somebody released videos of much of the leadership of Disney talking about their commitment, their religious commitment to the perversion of your children, to the grooming of your children into acceptance of sexual deviancy and perversity in opposition to everything taught by the scriptures, by the Lord Jesus Christ, his apostles and the prophets. And that is more than enough for me to never have anything to do with Disney ever, ever again. And to encourage others likewise to recognize that even what looks like an innocent investment uh, will be used by people like this with the specific purpose of promoting the most vile forms of sexual debauchery to the destruction of young lives, of children. Our children are now the, uh, the target. Well, they've always been a target, but now in infancy, I mean, the very government is talking about spending your tax dollars to make puberty blockers available to children that they themselves have confused. And puberty blockers, by the way, just a reminder, are not some benign little thing. They are absolutely destructive to human life. Destructive to human life. Any doctor that prescribes something like that should be hung by the neck until dead. 
Yes, you heard me say that. Those drugs destroy children. And so if you're going to destroy children, a sane nation will defend their children and will execute those who seek to destroy their children. Oh, that's too harsh. What are your standards? By what standard? By what standard? If you're a Christian, have you read your Bible recently? Why don't you go read Deuteronomy 28 and 29 and come back and get with me about harshness, okay? Hear that, or you just don't really believe that children should be defended. You don't really believe that they're talking about destroying children's bodies and lives and minds, but they are. They are. People just don't take any of this seriously anymore. They just, they just don't. And future generations, once God by his grace demonstrates fully and crushes secularism under the feet of Jesus, are going to look back at this generation as the worst. We talk about the best of all generations, the worst, most self-absorbed, emotion-ridden, all about me, people ever. I include myself in the generation. Anyway, I wanted to play you a section of this. Um, actually, I can't uh, start off that way because I've got to find a way to share it with you. Um, here is, uh, okay, Brave Browser. And then I'll go large on that, and hopefully this is going to work. There we go. And let's try to play this and see how it works. Oh. For all the... Well... Beautiful. Right. In fact, I would argue that in, in taking it from the best case scenario, both the right and the left. All right, here we go. I had it queued up and of course it went back to the beginning. complex are merely meant to represent and validate here we go. people who fit those minority identities. And that's equating it with race. And all I'm saying is it's not the same as race because they are not inherently immutable for all people in all places the way race is. And that needs to be handled differently and respected. So what you're saying is it's more complex and people want to oversimplify it. So yes. when people on the right say, if, if you want to talk about gender identity, in second grade is probably because you want to groom children to make them transgender. And on the left, we say, if you don't want us to be able to talk about gender identity in the second grade, it's because you're a bigot and you hate all, you know, non-binary, right. non-conforming people. And both left and right are oversimplifying a complex matter that no and it does representing it yeah it doesn't yeah, mean totally. you're a, you're a bigot if you're not comfortable with that and it doesn't mean you're a groomer if you think that would be right. valuable right in fact i would argue that in, in taking it from the best case scenario both the right and the left have very admirable reasons for their positions on the left it's we want to care for and represent and validate kids who are non-gender conforming and make them feel loved and welcomed amen on the right, it's we understand that for some young kids, gender confusion can lead to greater anxiety and distress in a way that doesn't exist if they're not introduced to that idea at a young age. And we want to protect them from unnecessary anxiety and stress that a second grader isn't ready for. And we want to introduce them to these ideas when we believe as the parents are ready. That's also a compassionate. And so they're both coming at it from compassionate Right. motives, right. but they're, for political and cultural reasons, being misrepresented in order to demonize the other side to score political points, which is just sad. Okay. If, if Josh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, yeah, oh, like oh, David. What, what are you doing there? I'm not sure what that was all about. Okay. So both sides are coming at this from a position of compassion, of compassion. Really? You wonder why 
we are getting absolutely nowhere in com uh, communicating to the world that there is a day of judgment coming, that there is an objective revelation of what is right and what is wrong. These people have already accepted the idea of gender non-conforming children. Instead of going, our society is, is engendering, using it in a different way, this confusion that would not be there if it were not for our society's rebellion against God's law and against God's way. They're accepting the idea that some massive percentage of children don't know what they are. It's absurd. Absolute absurdity. And yet they've accepted it. And once you accept that, once you see what, what they don't believe is that God has created us in a particular fashion and for a particular purpose. And that therefore God's law actually exists for our betterment because he's our creator, because he is our maker, then he knows exactly how we should live. He knows exactly how we should function. And that's what his law reveals to us. But once you reject that, and let's be honest, a very large portion of evangelicalism has rejected that. Once you don't have that anymore, let, let me... Let me mention something. Um, over the past number of months, I have I have seen over and over and over again. I, I have seen amongst good people, brothers and sisters in the Lord, I have seen the same kind of uh, how do I describe this? I'm trying to be very careful and accurate and ironic, everything else you have to be today. Um, willingness to accept less than accurate understandings of certain positions because it's sort of traditional to do so. Um, I did that kind of thing. I, I did that and accepted, we all do, you, you know, you, you're raised a certain way. You have certain um, prejudices as a result. And it's very easy to not listen to someone else's perspectives. So for example, um, the majority of people with whom I have conversation on social media these days, in regards to eschatology and my acceptance of a post-millennial understanding of eschatology, when I, I seek to speak with them, there's, there's actually an unwillingness on their part to hear a meaningful definition of what post-millennialism is all about. Instead, if their favorite preacher said that post-millennialism means that every single day it's better than the day before, you can go, well, that's not what it's saying at all. Uh, it actually is saying this. Oh, no, 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 that's what it's actually saying. And so since today's not as good as yesterday, therefore it must be false. And it's like, but, but that's, that's not what it's saying. You, you're, you're, you're misunderstanding. There's, there's a willing, there's no willingness to, to go there. In the same way, um, Doug Wilson put out a video I was watching uh, recently. And it's one of those videos where, you know, someone does quotes from it and they have the little animated figures. That really works well. I would, if there's anybody in, in our audience, because we did, remember we did that one video and really, it's really, really well done when, when people do this type of thing. It's a lot of work, but there are a couple topics I'd like to tackle and do a similar type of thing, to be perfectly honest with you, because... It, it does communicate and it does communicate really, really well. Um, but he put one out on general equity theonomy, which is the terminology used in Westminster Confession of Faith, general equity anyways. 
and was addressing various of the of the, of the um, objections to it and things like that. And anyone who's listened to the series I preached at PRBC years ago um, knows that that's where I've been for a long, long time. And yet there are so many people, so many people who will say, you can't hold a justification. You can't hold the imputed righteousness of Christ if you uh, believe in any form of theonomy at all. And I'm like, why? Because you believe you're justified by the law. No, I don't. But that's what theonomy is. No, it's not. And it's just, there's just not even a willingness to allow for definitions to take place. So I watched the, I'm making application now. I watched the uh, discussion that took place in 2015 at the NRB. I think I mentioned it in your last program, the program before last at the National Religious Broadcasters Casters thing that uh, Janet Parshall moderated. Uh, Michael Brown was on it. I forget what the woman's name was. And then uh, the author of Torn, Justin, and um, then Brandon Richardson, Robertson, Brandon Robertson. One, two, three, four. Yeah, five people. Okay. Uh, Janet kept moving around. So I'm just trying to see if I'd forgotten anybody. Um, it was frustrating to me. Obviously, you know, I agreed with what Michael had to say, and he very strongly presented a, a biblical understanding, and, and, and that's great. But what was missing from everybody, from everybody, was the normative function of the law of God in defining mankind, his purpose, his relationship to one another. There is a lot about feelings and emotions and, and wouldn't it be better for the church if this and la, la, la. But nobody. Oh, you could have, and there are people, the, the scriptural teaching is this, but there was a fundamental hesitation a fundamental hesitation to specifically make the statement, God's law defines what man is to be. God's law tells us how we are to do life, how we are to do relationship, how we are to do law, how we're to do government. God's law reveals these things. And there is there is such a fundamental antinomianism in evangelicalism that it's no wonder we only give half of the answer on issues of homosexuality, transgenderism, pedophilia, and all of it, because we're ashamed of God's law, because we haven't, we won't do what I did in that sermon series. There are a bunch of texts in there that we're afraid of because we've never thought it through. We've never made application. We've never seen the consistency. And it is, if, if my grandkids are going to be equipped to tell the post-Western collapse world the direction to go to find peace and prosperity in the future. They can't be afraid of one of the most important things God has given to us in his law. They just can't. None of us can. None of us can. We have to, we have to use everything God's given to us. And so as I, as I listen to what's going on in the world today, I am, I'm just reminded of not only the, the blessing of what God has given to us, but the blessing of believing his promises that Christ will put all of his enemies under his feet. And that may take a long time. And 
anyways, so with all of that said, I saw a video online and um, we had commented last week on Brandon Robertson. Again, he was on the panel in 2015. I could tell then it was only a matter of time. It was only a matter of time. He was not going to in any way, shape or form remain anywhere near connected to orthodoxy. And that has certainly been the reality. He's not even yet 30 years of age. Um, but uh, he is the one last year put out the video about Jesus's racism. And so uh, I, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about this other than to say once you that there is a we we must remember remember back when um the president of the sbc was saying that the bible um whispers about sexual sin and that um homosexuality is merely one sin amongst many listed in romans one and we responded and demonstrated that he was in error uh, that in fact, Romans 1 does not have homosexuality in the midst of what's called the vice list. But it is found before then in the section demonstrating the depth, the, the depth of the impact of rebellion on the part of man in the suppression of the knowledge of God. That this goes so far that even the defining desires of mankind. Knowledge of what a man is, what a woman is, what a man's supposed to do with a woman, what the natural function of the woman is, and vice versa, will be sacrificed to that rebellion. And that therefore, the argument is that homosexuality means that the rebellion against God goes to the deepest part of man even to this level, which if it became general would be the end of the species, right? A person who embraces that lifestyle and says, that's who I am, that's how God has made me, is a person who will go to any length to defend that perspective. And if they remain religious, that means they will go to any length in the perversion of the word of God to defend that perspective. And that's what Brandon Robertson is doing. And I believe we've only seen the beginning. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse unless God grants repentance. So when I saw this, um, this video, I was like, you you've got to be you've got to be kidding but wasn't kidding so let's listen it's only a minute and eight second a minute and two seconds long well it's about a minute long <laughs> well we don't have to be exact it's about a minute long and um all i gotta do is play it and then we'll make some some comments from there let's um Let's dive in. Did you know that Jesus helped his friend come out? In John chapter 11, verse 43, this is what it says. Jesus called out in a loud voice saying, Lazarus, come out. You see, Lazarus was locked up in a cold, dark tomb, wrapped in burial cloth, left for dead. That's exactly what so many Christians and so many churches do to LGBT people. They wrap us up and bind us up and tell us that we need to keep our identity, our true self locked away. But Jesus, upon seeing Lazarus in this state, he says, Lazarus, come out. Step into the light. Take off the cloth. Be who you are. Come alive. I believe that this is what Jesus is speaking to every LGBT person. Come out of the tomb of shame. Take off the chains that have bound you up. Step into the glory of who God made you to be, fearfully and wonderfully made, just as you are. You are beloved of God. Uh, 
Let, let me just start by saying that how you handle the word of God is exceptionally important. And if you as a false teacher twist the word of God in this fashion, you will answer for your having done so. This is not something to be taken lightly by any stretch of the imagination. This is an astonishing thing to do. It's astonishingly evil to twist the word of God in this way. There is not any time in, in all of church history where anyone up until the modern day would have looked at that text and made that application. You must reject the consistency of scripture, which he obviously has already. And then you must be willing to engage in an astonishing level of misrepresentation to come up with what we just heard in those, in those words. John chapter 11 is a tremendous passage teaching that Jesus has complete sovereignty over human life. It is a picture of the power of God to raise the spiritually dead to life. It is a picture of his power as the son of God, fulfilling what he had already been teaching in John chapter 5, John chapter 6, John chapter 8, John chapter 10. And as such, it should render a sense of awe in the heart of anyone. It's, when, when you're speaking to unbelievers, you can present to them a Jesus who once raised Lazarus. And I don't know what, where the Lazarus thing comes from. I, maybe there, it was edited, so I don't, maybe, maybe he made some, I don't know. But who raised, raised Lazarus from the dead to demonstrate the unity that existed between he and the Father. That was part of the purpose of having done so. This is the same Jesus who anyone like Brandon would have to admit, if what Brandon says is true, then there were many homosexuals and even transgenders. And within a few years, that long acronym will include minor attracted individuals, minor attracted people, MAPS. They'll put an M in there or whatever they call it. And so in a very short period of time, to be open-minded, to be loving, you need to include them in the list. Uh, even though I can remember not very long ago when you would have been pilloried for saying that that would happen. You, you're just, that is absurd. That would never happen. We're not saying that. Well, it's happening now. We all see it. We all see it happening all around us. Um, but they would have to, admit that in Jesus' ministry, when he was speaking to the crowds, if he knew what was in the hearts of men, there were homosexuals in front of him, right? They were made that way. There were transgender people made that way. And they could not live out. They could not be their best selves, their true selves. Notice how he used that language. So he's saying it's something that God creates in people. They couldn't be their true selves because they'd be stoned, they'd be executed. And Jesus knew, because he knows what's in the hearts of men, right? Never said a word, never said a word. Instead, he said, if you teach men to break even one of the least of the commandments, you'll be least in the kingdom of God. Huh. In fact, he said he was the fulfillment of the law. That doesn't mean the doing away with, but the fulfillment, its goal, its end, its purpose. It pointed to him. It's a 
our tutor to lead us unto Christ. Huh. The law that kept them from being their true selves. And yet Jesus never said a word. But when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he was letting, he was helping his friend to come out. That kind of utter twisting of the scriptures, the utter twisting of language, only works on unregenerate individuals who want to be deceived. Because, I mean, even in the context, even within the context of unbelieving people, just simply a person who, for example, studies ancient literature would be able to go, um, no, that's not, no, that's, that's not what that's about. That, for fair, we'll have to admit that's not what that was about at all. But when you are a pastor of an affirming church, which is nothing but a synagogue of Satan, um, then you can say whatever you want, and there's already a perversity in the mind that is then attracted to perversity of teaching. Because people wonder, why do people go to churches like this? Everybody knows that you're just going to hear what you want to be told. Well, that's what happens in your church too. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. There are very often very convicting sermons that tell us what we don't want to hear based upon the word of God. Well, it happens there too. We're told that we need to strive for justice. The vision of God and justice and of the Christian faith in those churches is always simply a reflection of its leadership. That's all it ever is. Because the word of God isn't believed there. This man doesn't believe the word of God. He's not under the authority of the word of God, but he is a twister of the word of God. He is a perverter of the word of God. And he's not the only one, but he is representative of so much of what we see going on all around us in this day. So we must ourselves be skilled in exegesis in understanding how to handle the scriptures not based on some tradition, but to actually honor them as the word of God. If this is the word of God, then we will honor it as the word of God. And you have to handle it in a certain way to honor it as the word of God. And then we'll pass those skills on to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. As, as a more important aspect of their inheritance than anything else you could ever give them from this world. Ever thought of it that way? It's true. It's true. Think of it in those, those lines. Something just popped up on, I guess we should stop eating um, eggs. Avian flu. Egg prices soaring. I don't know. I don't know. I got, I've got a dozen in the refrigerator. I guess that's all I'm going to get to have. So... There you go, Lord. <laughs> Bless your people and protect them. So continue to pray for the ministry up here, uh, ministry out in uh, Mesa, Arizona, apologia, passing out tracts and stuff to the Mormons out there. Uh, ask them to draw, ask the Lord to draw those people out so that we can have those conversations we love to have, introduce them to the truth, and uh, we appreciate that. I'm not sure when we'll be getting together next week, I need to look at the schedule. It could be regular. We'll see. Just get the app. Make sure you've got it. And uh, we'll still be up here in Salt Lake City next week. It's supposed to have snow on Tuesday. So, hey, 74 degrees outside right now. Might still have um, the window will be closed, but there might be snow coming down. Who knows? Could be fun. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. God bless.